Hi guys, Olive here, here today to tell you about the books I read in February 2022. I read a lot of really great books in February. I'm very excited to talk about them, so I'm going to jump straight in. As I have been doing in my previous few videos, my wrap up and TBR videos, I'm going to start off this wrap up by talking about all the fiction books I read in February, and then I will move into talking about nonfiction since I read a little bit of both last month. But the book I want to start with is The Pleasing Hour by Lily King, which was actually her debut novel. This one is actually pretty light on plot, which is typical for a Lily King book, even though this was her debut novel. It's about a young American woman who is escaping something back home. So she moves to Paris and she starts working as an au pair for a family who lives aboard a houseboat. And as we go along, we start learning more about our main character, what she was running away from. But also we learn more about this French family. More specifically, we learn a lot about the mother of this family. And we come to find out that this main character basically by the day is becoming more and more and kind of dangerously intertwined in their lives. I'm a sucker for books about nannies, au pairs, or anyone working in childcare, because I've had that job before. And I know what it's like to be kind of a part of a family, but then also kind of not. And the whole time you're really painfully aware of it. Like it allows you to see things about the family that they don't see about themselves. And you're welcomed in, but you're also held at arm's length because you're not actually a family member. You're employed by the family. I also really like that we got to see this main character's language learning journey. When she came to Paris, her French was not all that great, but then you can feel her improving but then you have all the stumbling moments of trying to find a word, but not quite knowing what it is. So kind of using all the words you do know to circle in on that word you don't know, that felt very true to life as well. I've had those experiences as well. So this felt very close to me and that I understood what the main character was going through in two different regards. I also think if you would like to pair this book up with a nonfiction book, I have an unconventional suggestion. I would recommend you read this alongside me talking Pretty One Day by David Sedaris, because he talks a lot in that book about living in France and trying to learn French and how awkward it all is. I definitely noticed some similarities between these two books. So the language learning element and the nanny element, I really liked those two things, not just because I'm personally connected to both of those things, but also because I think they were well done in this book. But everything else I didn't feel was done very well. Like you can definitely tell that she had talent in this book, but it feels like a debut novel. It feels like she has a lot of promise because the quiet atmosphere of her later books and also the focus on the inner worlds of the characters that her later books have, you can feel that that is present in this book, but she just hadn't refined it yet. And she didn't focus on storytelling in this book. Like there wasn't enough meat on the bone of the story to really pull you through. It felt like her intention was to just introduce you to a whole bunch of different characters and give you their perspectives. Like, why did we need to hear from the children? It didn't really add anything to the story. If it had, that would be a different thing, but I don't think it did. So you can definitely feel that this is a Lily King book. It feels like Lily King. It's just that she hadn't refined her talents quite yet. Another book I read this month from an author whose backlist I have been slowly working my way through is The Position by Meg Wallitzer. This book is about a family with four children and the parents of this family in the 1970s put out a joy of sex type book. And this book and its notoriety goes on to have an effect on every single member of this family over the years in positive and negative ways. I wasn't really expecting a whole lot from this book because to be honest, I have found a lot of books in Meg Wallitzer's backlist to be very middling. I like some of them, other ones I could take or leave, but I really enjoyed this. We get to learn about all the different members of this family. We learn about the parents, how they met, how they came to write this book, but then also the children, how they discovered this book for the first time and the impact that it had on them both as children and now as adults. This was the first book that I read in her backlist that made me think, oh, I can tell this is by the author of The Interestings. 
This is the most the interestings like book that I have read of hers thus far. Anyway, I still have a few to go. But just the way we get to learn about all these different characters, the way we follow them, the way we get to see how life turns out for them, like it just felt like I was reading an early version of The Interestings. But the only thing that The Interestings has that I think this book could have really benefited from was more scenes where we get to see the whole family together and interacting as a group. Meg Wallitzer has such a way of writing group dynamics. Like you can feel the electricity in a room when she writes about it. But because all of these characters, like these are grown children, they're scattered all over the place and they're not all on good terms with one another. I know that would have been challenging story-wise, but I think this book would have really benefited from it. That was the only thing that didn't push the this book over the edge into five star territory for me. But as it stands, this is a solid four star book. Like if you like the interestings, as I do, it is one of my favorite fiction books, then I really recommend you read this one. But even though the position was not the five star read that I was really hoping it would be, I did actually read my very first five star fiction read of the year in February. It's a new release called When We Lost Our Heads by Heather O'Neill. The publisher very kindly reached out to me and offered to send me a finished copy of it when they saw it in my February TBR. Thank you so much. I'm grateful regardless, but I am extra grateful because I loved this and I know I'm going to want to reread this many times in the future, so I'm so happy I own it. This book sounds just so strange when you try to describe it, but I promise you it works. This next thing is going to sound weird as I describe the book, but I promise you it works in this book. This book sits at the center of a Venn diagram. The two circles are Victorian era Montreal and the French Revolution. This book sits right in between. And it basically asks the question, what would these famous figures of the French Revolution look like if instead of who they actually were in the time period in which they actually lived, they were young girls fighting for equal status in the Industrial Revolution in Montreal. There are two major characters in this book. I mean, there's a whole cast of characters and they're all important, but the two main ones are these two young women. We meet them as young girls. We see them grow up into young women and they are completely complete opposites. But like magnets, they are attracted to one another. They have this intense love for each other. But then they also have a very complicated competitive relationship. Marie is based on Marie Antoinette. And Sadie is based on the Marquis de Sade. And there are other famous names from the French Revolution in here as well. This novel is full of so many contrasts that if you like this sort of thing, it will just keep you glued to this book. I mean, this book is vibrant, but then it's filthy. It's innocent. And then it's murderous. It's tender, but then it's brutal. It's not written in a flowery way, but the words that she chooses are so deliberate that it really packs a punch. I loved this book even more than I loved The Lonely Hearts Hotel. And that was one of my favorite novels of 2020. I just love this magical yet gritty style that she has. So if you like that, if you liked The Lonely Hearts Hotel, then I am pretty positive you will also like this one. And it will be an extra treat for you if you have an interest in the French Revolution. A special treat for me in February was a reread of Persuasion by Jane Austen. It had been a long time since I had picked up something from Jane Austen. And I rightly guessed before I reread this book, that during my first read through, I missed a lot. Like I really felt that there were holes in my understanding of persuasion. And since there's going to be a new Netflix adaptation here soon, I hope really soon, it hasn't even really been announced when that's coming out. But I thought this would be a good moment for me to give it a try during the romantic month. And for this reread, I decided to read the annotated edition. And I can't even tell you how happy I am that I did that. Those annotations gave me so much 
historical context and added information that I obviously understood the book a whole lot better the second time. And therefore, I enjoyed it more because I understood more and because I could appreciate it more. But also, I feel like with the help of those annotations, I was able to read this book more deeply than I have ever read a book before. Like the real world did not exist for me when I was rereading Persuasion. <laughs> like I felt like I was inside of the world, looking around, seeing the characters, understanding them so well. I came out of that trance-like experience with this theory about why Anne Elliot turned down Wentworth. It is a little detail that I have never heard anyone else talk about. I made a whole video about that theory, and I also talk about Anne's sisters in that video and why I think they deserve a little bit more sympathy. I'll link that video for you in the description box below and up in the cards if you'd like to watch it. I have to say, I'm proud of all of my videos but I'm extra proud of that one. So that was all the fiction that I read during the month of February, but I very briefly want to tell you about a written review of mine that actually just appeared. It came out on March 1st, but I wanted to talk about it in this video because there's something related to it that I wanted to mention. But that book is The Bald Eagle by Jack E. Davis, which I reviewed for the Christian Science Monitor. This is a natural and cultural history of the bald eagle, that symbol of of the United States of America that actually stared extinction in the face, not once, but twice. I will link my review of this book in the description box below. I am really happy with how it turned out. And obviously, I was thrilled to get the chance to write about a bird book. I wanted to mention that book sooner rather than later, because I also wanted to tell you that bald eagles are in their nesting season right now. And there are some great live nest cams that you can watch for free here on YouTube, including a couple here in the Pittsburgh area. There is one that I've been paying close attention to. It's in the Hayes neighborhood, and they have three eggs. Everyone's been guessing in the chat when those are going to hatch, which seems like it might be around the 20th to the 21st, based on what's happened in prior years and based on when the eggs were laid and the incubation period and all of that. But I wanted to tell you this ahead of time so that if you would like to tune in, you would have a chance to see those eggs hatch. Because by the time my March wrap up comes along, they will probably already be out of their eggs. <laughs> I will link that for you in the description box below. And I will also link another more active nest that I am like emotionally invested in. <laughs> There's an osprey nest I believe it's in Florida. And these two rather young ospreys, I think this is their first ever nest, they are raising three babies that are getting bigger by the day. And I check in on them every single day. But do know that if you click on that link, turn your volume down before you do so, because especially the mother osprey, she really likes to call quite frequently, and she's very loud. <laughs> but now let me tell you about the other nonfiction books I read during February. And the first one was one that I listened to on audiobook. It was Heartbreak by Florence Williams. And this audiobook was actually provided to me for free for reviewing purposes by the company that produced the audiobook. So many thanks. Shortly before she started writing this book, this author's husband decided to end their marriage after 25 years and two kids after a whole life together. And the author was, to put it mildly, absolutely heartbroken. She had never gone through heartbreak before she had been with her husband for that long. And so even though she had heard about heartbreak a million times, I mean, it feels like half the songs in the world are written about heartbreak. She had never experienced it herself. And she was astonished by how much it hurt, physically hurt. So being the journalist that she is, she decided to start researching why it hurts so bad, what happens to the human body when we're feeling heartbroken, and what we can do, or what she can do, to move past it. Like I alluded to before, heartbreak is a very commonplace thing. We hear about it all the time. A lot of us will go through heartbreak in our lifetimes. But I don't think most of us, including me before I experienced this book, understand 
how big of an impact heartbreak has on the human body, how detrimental it is for us. I mean, we all know the negative effects of stress, which heartbreak is, but it's also grief, but then it can and often does have an element of rejection, which is so devastating to members of a social species like ours. So throughout this book, the author talks to a number of different scientists and researchers who talk about what the physical manifestations of heartbreak are, and some of them are jaw-dropping. It is all fascinating stuff, but it was really the audiobook that took this to the next level for me because not only does the author narrate it herself, which is always wonderful, but this book has all of this bonus audio material, which by the nature of it being audio material couldn't be in the physical book, couldn't be in the ebook. You get to hear these audio journals the author was keeping at the time talking about her situation. You get to hear recordings of conversations that she had with the researchers and the scientists. So you feels like you actually get Get to know them as you're hearing what they have to say. Then you get to hear more personal recordings where the author is talking to her friends or family members who are helping her through this hard time. It made all of it feel just so personal and so intimate. Like this author was your friend who you knew was going through a really hard time. And every single time you'd pick up the audiobook again, it was like you were checking in on her to make sure that she was doing okay. I enjoyed this so much. I really recommend it if you like audiobooks or even if you like podcasts. I could actually see this being a good gateway listen for you. If you are into podcasts, but you don't really like audiobooks, you want to get into audiobooks, I could see you liking this one because it kind of feels like a podcast at points. But I also really recommend this if you want to learn more about the shocking science of heartbreak. I also picked up Let's Get Physical by Danielle Friedman when it became available at my library. This is a history of women's exercise, beginning with the days when people thought women's bodies were just too delicate to engage in exercise. But then it moves through the years, talks about the development of things like the bar workout and jazzercise. And of course, it includes all things Jane Fonda. As someone who regularly reads and writes about women in sports, I found it fascinating to learn about the evolution of women's exercise and attitudes toward women exercising, using their bodies, becoming physically strong. I really, really enjoyed reading this. I thought it was very well researched, beautifully presented, and honestly, really motivating. Like, I don't think anyone will come out of this reading experience without a desire to get up and move around. <laughs> I know I certainly didn't escape that natural consequence of reading this book. I've actually been really into these hip hop fit workouts here on YouTube. They're done by a wonderful guy named Mike Peel. I will link one of those for you in case you're looking for some more inspiration. Then the last two nonfiction books that I read in February, the last two books I'll be talking about in this video. I wanted to talk about them together since I thought they worked so well as a pair. It was kind of unexpected. So first, I finally got to the top of the holds list for the 2021 National Book Award for Nonfiction winner, All That She Carried by Taya Miles. This book is centered around a family keepsake. It's this very humble cotton sack that an enslaved mother gave to her daughter when they were separated. And that bag once housed items that the young girl would need when they parted. And that daughter kept the bag through the years, passed it on down the generations. And her granddaughter, so the great granddaughter of the original owner of this bag, embroidered her family's story, the story of that bag, onto the bag itself. In this book, the author does a tremendous amount of research trying to track down who this mother-daughter pair very well may have been. We can't know for sure, but she has a very solid theory. And then she uses everything connected 
to this bag. So the contents that the bag had, and even the embroidery, she talks about the art of embroidery, everything connected with this bag. She talks about to give you historical context, cultural context, to help you understand what the lives of Black women would have been like at that time. The way the author handles everything makes this story feel so alive. I mean, she's taking guesses about things sometimes, and you still can feel like you are in the shoes of the people she's talking about. And I think what made this book extra special is the fact that she is honest about the horrors that they endured, but she is also very honest about how much love there is in this story. This mother made sure that her daughter had as much as she could give her before they were separated, never to see one another again. And this daughter loved her mother so much that she kept that bag as she grew older, told her descendants about it to the point where her granddaughter embroidered the story onto the bag. There is so much love in this story. So not only is this book brilliantly researched, which it is, it is also incredibly touching. I think it absolutely deserved the National Book Award, and I am so happy that I read it. And right after I read it, I then picked up Maya Angelou's extremely famous memoir, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, in which she discusses her early life up until she was 17 years old. I'm not quite sure what I was expecting from this, but it was actually a lot different than I thought it was going to be. It's basically a record of what she remembers from her early life. So growing up mainly in Arkansas in the Jim Crow South, but then also spending periods of time in St. Louis in California. She talks about her relationship with her parents, her brother, and her grandmother. I feel like all that she carried was such a great lead-in to finally reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, because they're both about the lives of Black women, But in one case, we have to speculate. The author had to do all this research to try to give these women voices, to try to tell us what their lives would have been like. So it was really powerful to then see after the passing of just a handful of generations, we go from Black women not being able to tell their stories to getting to hear from a Black woman about what life was like for her growing up. The memoir itself is really beautiful. There were certain passages that just stopped me in my tracks. I had to take a moment with them. I can see why this is so well loved. I can see why it is still widely read. I'm really happy that I finally read it. I'm happy that I got to read both of these books. So those were the books of February. It was a really amazing reading month for me. All the books I read were three stars and above. I really couldn't ask for more. All the books that I discussed in today's video will be linked in the description box below for your clicking convenience. If you have read or want to read any of them, let me know in the comment section below. Any other more general comments or questions you may have can go there as well. But if you would like to keep up with what I am reading and writing about right now, in this exact moment, you don't want to wait for my next video, you want to know what I'm reading, you can find me on a variety of places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, where I'm the most active. The links to my profiles will be at the bottom of the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.